I hope this will be interesting for you. My name is Bram Verburg. I work at Blue Code. We write most of our backend systems in Elixir, which is a language on the Erlang virtual machine. And my day job is basically making sure, primarily making sure that our application code, what we write in-house, is, is secure. So normally I work at that like intersection of security and, and Erlang. And so I go to conferences of Erlang users and I talk to them about security, or I go to a security conference to talk about Erlang. Now, I suppose in this audience, most of you don't fit into either category necessarily, so I try to make something a bit more know, conceptual, high level. And so I, I'm, I am coming to this still with my own Erlang background. I am very much biased. I'm going to say a lot of good things about Erlang, mostly because they're just True, um, but um, I'm also going to compare to other languages and I might completely misrepresent your favorite language. Uh, I'd be happy to hear that you know, things have moved on also in other languages and maybe some of the features that I claim are missing are actually available. Talk to me, I'd love to, I'd love to hear really. Um, but again, the, the, it, this talk is not primarily about convincing you to use Erlang. It is about exploring the idea that concurrency abstractions, such as those provided by Erlang, can help us make more secure software. Okay, so as an outline for this talk, I, I want to talk a little bit about how we used to do mem memory management and what has changed since those early days. Then I want to introduce like, some basic concurrency concepts and I want to describe to you what I mean when I talk about secure, uh, concurrency abstractions. Um, then I want to talk about the security potential, and I'm carefully using the word potential here because not all of this has been fully realized. These are ideas. Um, there's room for improvement in Erlang and in other languages too. And um, I'll look a little bit about at, at some uh, languages that in, uh, implement concurrency, abstractions, and I'll finish up with some challenges and, and future work. What needs to be done to maybe realize some of these uh, potential benefits? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about memory management. I'm sure some of you are old enough to remember um, The, uh, the slides are not showing the graphics. Okay, there's some graphics in the background that are hard to see on the slide. Doesn't matter, they're not important. Um, so we used to explicitly allocate memory on the heap, right? Um, if you're coding in C or Pascal or languages like that way back when, as an application developer, you had to allocate them, uh, memory structures and remember to deallocate them. Also, you had to do uh, pointer arithmetic to traverse data structure. So you'd have to calculate the, st you know, the start of the data structure of the list or whatever data structure you were processing, calculate where in that buffer you need to be and make sure not to make mistakes in your ar arithmetic, which of course you did have bugs and that led to all sorts of vulnerabilities. Um, Memory leak is, the, the, is, is relatively benign. I mean, your application might, might, might crash, but some of these vulnerabilities or some of these bugs can lead to very serious vulnerabilities, um, as, we, as we all know, right? Um, so there were some languages at the time that didn't do heap allocation at all, but that prevented some of those vulnerabilities. But there were also languages that were doing automatic memory management already. Um, many, many years ago. Um, so memory being implicitly allocated when you create a data structure and all this pointer arithmetic being taken care of by the compiler and the runtime. So for that you need, of course, garbage collection, um, either tracing garbage collector or reference counting. And this pushes the responsibility of memory management into the runtime. So you need a runtime, unlike with C, where the standard library is kind of passive. It's something you call when you need some higher level function. These languages require some sort of runtime, some sort of 
thing that runs alongside your code and does something and takes that responsibility away from you. So the, the, the benefits are that you get a proven, tested, scrutinized runtime taking care of these things instead of you having to do those things over and over again in your application code. Right? The memory management at the lowest level is still the same. You still call the same operating system calls to allocate memory. It's just that someone else does it for you, and that someone else is being used by so many other people that you can have reasonable I don't know, assurances that it's correct and it doesn't introduce the kind of vulnerabilities that I mentioned in the previous slide. So now, I want to talk about concurrency. So concurrency is not just about scaling across cores or processors or servers. Okay, that's parallelism, right? You want to be able, in your application, to take advantage of the resources available on a single server or across multiple servers. Um, so concurrency is also about dealing with the asynchronous nature of the world in which your application operates. Um, HTTP requests, uh, other kind of network interactions, other kind of I.O. Um, so when you're designing an application, you need to think about the, the parallelism, the utilizing the, the available cores, but you also need to think about how you're going to handle the, the fact that you're dealing with lots of interactions at, at once. Um, now, you need to kind of choose a unit of concurrency um, OS processes or OS threads or green threads, lightweight threads that are managed by your, your language runtime. Now, unfortunately, in some languages, you basically choose twice. Once you choose for, for parallelism, you might choose operating system processes and just run as many copies of your application as you have uh, CPU cores. And then within the application, you use maybe uh, promises, futures, I don't know what these things are called these days, um, to deal with the asynchronous nature of your application and the fact that you have all these various requests going on. Um, what else do you need to do? You need to define, you need to choose a way of communicating internally within your application. So you can use shared memory if you're on the same CPU. Um, you may have to go through some external system. Uh, maybe it's the database, maybe it's Redis, maybe it's Kafka, I don't know. Um, which has the advantage that it works regardless of whether the other process that you're talking to is running on the same machine or even on a different machine. Or you can use message passing, which I will define in more detail in the next slide. Um, and you need to worry about like, process management, so, uh, monitoring, fault tolerance, recovery. You want to know what's going on inside your application. You may need to ensure that there is always exactly one copy of a certain process running across the cluster of, of, of machines that, that host your application. You may need statistics, I don't know. So all these things are kind of decisions that need to be made when you're writing a concurrent application. And if you as an application developer have to make these kind of decisions and then implement them yourself, then there's a potential for mistakes, and as we know, bugs can lead to vulnerabilities. So, what do I mean when I, when I say automatic concurrency management? So just like we talked previously about automatic me memory management, what if we could push these, some of these um, responsibilities down into the runtime? And have, I don't know, the language designer or the, 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 the stack that we're using make some of those decisions for us and give us abstractions to work with. Okay, so something that's built into the language and the, the language part, purely in terms of syntax, may not be very big. It's, it's things like message sending and receiving, which often comes with a notion of pattern matching, because that's very useful for when you're processing messages, to be able to pattern match on the incoming messages and ignore messages that are maybe arriving out of, out of sequence. Um, 
often you will find a, a functional paradigm, functional programming uh, languages that implement such features. And in functional programming, you often find immutable data, so variables that don't get changed under the under the nose of your of your code. Like, for example, if you uppercase a string, you get a new string which has been uppercased. If some other part of your code was referring to that same variable, it is still pointing to the string before it was uppercased. These things don't kind of magically happen under the codes. You, you won't have these kind of surprises that suddenly someone else modified the data. OK, you, besides the language impact, you need something in the runtime environment. You need runtime support for this, uh, these concurrency abstractions. So this is where the green threads are typically uh, defined. So the, usually you have a scheduler that schedules these many processes that run your application. Um, these processes are isolated from one another. They don't have shared state. Um, they, there is a process monitoring uh, capability so that if some process dies, you know about it and you can try and recover from it. So that helps you implement fault tolerance. Okay, now, I, as I said at the start, I'm coming to this from the Erlang world, and you see that I'm very opinionated about what I think automatic concurrency ma management should look like. If someone comes up with a different set of features, um, fair enough, we can, we can talk about that. What I'm saying is if a language and a runtime implement some of these features and take away responsibilities from application developers to think about such things, we might, li we might get cleaner code, fewer bugs, fewer vulnerabilities. Um, you may need some, there are some trade-offs sometimes, like some of the things you see here, you might think, well, that's not going to be efficient, is it? Like immutable data, now I have two copies of that string. It's more efficient to transform a string to uppercase rather than copying it and creating a new one, right? In fact, in practice, the runtime can take all sorts of shortcuts, do all sorts of optimizations as long as the guarantees are not violated. So you can um, take a shortcut. If you know that this, this particular uh, memory is not referenced anywhere else, you could, for example, uppercase it in place and, and know that no other variable is, is still pointing to that memory location. Um, another kind of side effect of this kind of architecture is that garbage collection becomes very simple. You don't need to stop the world garbage collector because every process only has its own view of the memory, and therefore you can do garbage collection within a process. And often it's not even necessary because if you're, if you're handling an HTTP request, if the HTTP request finishes before your garbage collector kicks in, you can just deallocate all the memory for that process and be done with it. So that actually leads to, to optimization. So there will be trade-offs. If you're going to go for raw processing power, this is not going to give you the, the, the highest throughput, but um, we're, we're aiming for benefits here, just like with the automatic memory management, which is not the most efficient way of memory, uh, managing memory, but nowadays memory is cheap, CPU is cheap, we can accommodate a little bit of a, a, a performance impact if, if it gives us solid benefits. So, what I'm saying is, can we stop the application developer from worrying about concurrency features? So let's look at, look at that. So what are the security benefits? Um, so I mentioned immutable data structures. I mentioned isolated processes. And I mentioned resilience, fault tolerance. Okay, so these words, do they remind you of something? In security, the, a, a very, some very important security principles are co often called the CIA triad. That's integrity, confidentiality, and availability. And those features I'm, I mentioned near the top are, map pretty easily into those, those concepts. 
immutability and isolation can help ensure integrity. Isolation can help implement confidentiality and resilience can provide availability. So let's look at each of these in a bit more detail. Starting with integrity. So the, the process model I described earlier, lightweight green threads with no shared state, it's often called the actor model. In the actor model, lightweight processes are fully isolated from each other and they communicate with each other using message passing. And that makes these actors, um, the, the, the state changes in these actors, in these processes are very explicit. They are transactional and, and they are serialized. So it's a bit like, I don't know, software transactional memory, right? The only way to modify the, the, the state of a process is by sending messages to it and getting replies from that process. There's no way to reach in and change something. So if multiple things are ac accessing that same actor, they will have to wait for each other and that gives you um, integrity guarantees about the state of that process. Okay, and all this happens without the application developer having to think in terms of locks, semaphores, mutexes, you know, all the tooling that you traditionally think of for in ensuring the integrity of your data. Okay, so this can help prevent certain race conditions. Um, there was a, a vulnerability in GitHub some time ago where they were several processes, several HTTP request handlers were basically writing to and reading from a, the same cookie store, same cookie jar. And under sp very specific circumstances, uh, the cookie from one user was actually sent to another user. And they, that user ended up getting access to resources that they shouldn't have access to. Okay, that should, should not be possible, right, in your application. But if you have to think about all these interactions yourself as an application developer, it's difficult to be sure that there isn't some very specific sequence of events that might lead to the wrong information being written or read and leading to these kind of vulnerabilities. Okay, let's talk about confidentiality. So confidentiality is about making sure information doesn't fall into the wrong hands, right? Um, now, if your, if, if your application logic implements short-lived processes with a, a dedicated scope, with a very dedicated um, uh, responsibility, then, and, and that process only really has access to the data that is immediately available to it in, inside its, its state, you can make sure that information isn't even available there to be leaked. So I'll give you an example. Um, handling HTTP requests from different users, either concurrently or sequentially. So one of the things you do at the start of an HTTP request is authenticate the user, right? You go into the database, you compare their password or you check their session cookie, and then you set up the process with information about the user and you start doing your business logic. If the process that is handling this request is later recycled to handle another user's request, you have to be very sure to clean up what you've done so that you don't end up leaking information to, to the wrong user. If your process is short-lived and isolated, the, it, the information from the previous user is just not accessible to that other process, right? The process dies, the garbage collection doesn't even happen, the, all the memory associated with that process is gone, and for the next user, you spin up a new process, everything is blank, and you start over again. A sim an another example, so segregation of application code with lower level um, 
aspects of your application. So if you were to, I mean, let's, let's talk hypothetically. I'm, you're, you're serving HTTPS from within your application. I know that in practice you put a load balancer in front of your application, but let's say you, you handle HTTPS request. You need to terminate the TLS handshake before you can start processing the HTTP request. If you do that in a single process, then it means that process that is handling your HTTP request, that is doing your business logic, has access to the private key of your TLS server, right? Now, hopefully there is no input parameters in your HTTP request that could cause that to leak. But, you know, bugs happen. Um, this is what Heartbleed was about, right? The, S the SSL vulnerability uh, Heartbleed basically allowed an attacker to read the private key simply because the memory, it, it lived in the same memory that was handling the request. It, it's, it's maybe a bad example because Heartbleed was a, a, a vulnerability in the TLS implementation itself. But wouldn't it be cool if you could like fully segregate the TLS protocol stack from your HTTP request handler in a way that the, they don't share the memory space. They don't have access to the private key at all. Okay, and lastly, let's talk about availability. So, in terms of in, in availability, one of the things we can do is we can try to minimize the blast radius. So, so things will go wrong, right? Some, someone will send a bad request with some weird encoding of query parameters, and your application wasn't prepared to handle that. Boom, it blows up. You get a 500 server error. What else fails at that moment? How do you know that such an error doesn't propagate into the rest of your application and starts to affect other users? Okay, another part of it is getting your application back in a known good state. Because if an HTTP request fails, it's pretty easy, right? You just abort that request, it goes away, one user is affected, no harm done. But if some background process is affected, maybe some process that is doing some important uh, coordination within your application, what if it crashes? How do you get your application back? Well, we all know how to do that, right? Um, have you tried switching it off and on again? So what if we could do that at the process level and say, if this process, die this process is, is critical to my application, if it dies, restart it. If that doesn't help, go up one level and try and reset the part of the application that is, is, is that this process is part of, and you go up the tree until you manage to get your application back into a, a known good state. So in Erlang, you, you define a supervision, uh, supervision tree for your application that basically prescribes this known good state of your application and the interdependencies between the processes that make up your application and the system then makes sure that the application is always in this known good state. Anything that happens, it will start to get to work to fix things. And that might mean killing other processes that are dependent on this, uh, this process that died. Or starting them in a certain order, like stopping all the processes that were started after this process and then starting again from there. Um, so this helps you keep your application in a, in a working state. So this is self-healing of the application. Now, we talked about the, the, the CIA triad, but I think there's one more aspect that we need to talk about. And I decided to call that clarity. Okay, clarity is basically the expressiveness of your code. So if, if you can express your business logic as linear code, 
without worrying about asynchronous interactions with other parts of your application, with other systems that your application depends on, such as a database or some external API. If you can express state machines using explicit uh, state uh, transitions, you end up with cleaner, clearer code. If you can ignore some of the um, potential errors that could cause a process to die, if you can focus on the happy path and just let the fault tolerance, the self-healing features of the application deal with things that shouldn't really happen, right? When you still need a, a case statement that handles the unauthenticated user and returns a 401, that is something that's expected. You know that this is going to happen, and the product manager, whoever defined the requirements of your API, will tell you, here you need to return a 401, and that code path needs to, be, needs to exist in your code. But there are also things that should never happen. Okay, this, this environment variable is not set. Well, that's a problem for the DevOps team, right? They, they, it shouldn't, the application shouldn't have been deployed like this in the first place. There's nothing I can do to recover from it. I shouldn't have to have code that tries to deal with this error that should never really happen. Okay, let it crash is the Erlang strategy there. And hopefully the, the, the self-healing uh, mechanisms will kick in and get the application back in a working state. But if that environment variable is critical for the application to work, then the application might as well crash. Okay, but that keeps your code focused on the happy path rather than having all sorts of extra code for dealing with things that shouldn't really happen. Um, another thing that can help with the clarity of your code is having fewing, fewer moving parts. So I explained earlier how concurrency is not the same as parallelism, and if you have to implement those using different mechanisms, you're using OS processes to do parallelism, and uh, uh, promises or, or other callback mechanisms to deal with concurrency, now you have like two mechanisms and you need to figure out, okay, if this happens in this context, then I can use shared memory to talk to this other process because it lives in the same process, but if this process is another process on the same machine or a different machine, now I need to have a separate mechanism for doing this communication. If everything is just processes, lightweight processes, all the way on the same machine, on a different machine, and you can just transparently talk to between them if you have to, it becomes, you have fewer moving parts, you have fewer concepts that you have to mentally juggle and it be, your, your code becomes clearer. Um, complexity is a liability. The more complex your application becomes, the more risk there is of, of bugs, the harder it is for future developers to come along and make, make changes. So simplicity can be a real security benefit. Okay, now, having said all that, some of this maybe you can implement without support by the language, by the runtime. Maybe you can just apply some principles to your own code base, regardless of which language it's written in and what features this language provides. Okay, um, as an example, proponents of functional programming always say that functional code is easier to test because functional code, pure functional code, takes, functions take arguments and return a return value. And that's it. Nothing else happens. Nothing else can affect the return of that function. And that makes it very easy to test. You just need to figure out which input values you need to try and what return values you're expecting. The part of your application that actually has to deal with the outside world what functional programmers call effects, can be very small and, and, and concentrated. All the complexity of your business logic can live in those functions that can be very thoroughly tested because they are purely functional, they don't have side effects. Okay, so you can apply that in any language. You can do that in, in Java too. It just requires a bit of, um, I don't know, defining some rules for yourself and sticking with them. So that brings me to the next question. Like, do we really need a separate runtime, a separate 
language that's, that can support these features. Um, so can we do concurrency abstractions as a library? Now, I, th I think if you want the full benefits, you're going to need at least green threads, right? If you're going to do this, use, if you're going to write linear code in a language that doesn't have green threads, then you're going to have to use operating system threads because that is the next level up concurrency primitive that's available, and that's not going to scale in most type of applications. But it's not just green threads. You're going to need, if you want to do this properly, if you want to have, for example, the self-healing features of the supervision tree, you're going to need some sort of process monitoring. If one of your green threads dies, others may have to know about that. And this is often, often missing in, in runtimes that do have green threads. And who prevents shared mutable state? Like, of course, you would have to become responsible, you have to be responsible for making sure that processes don't access data outside of their own scope because the runtime doesn't guarantee this. And then, finally, there is an impedance mismatch at the boundary because you're still calling into libraries um, that, that were not written with these principles in mind. Right? It's a bit like doing static typing on a language that doesn't really do static types. You, the compiler can enforce for your code that all your type information is correct, all your, all your function calls are safe, but at some point you're going to have to interact with some other library that was not written with static typing, and at the boundary, who knows what will happen. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples, and of course my first example is Erlang. I told you I'm biased. So Erlang ticks a lot of the boxes, um, and I, I say Erlang, I actually mean like the Erlang ecosystem, because other languages like Elixir, LFE, Gleam, they all benefit from the, from the same runtime, from the same functionality that it provides. So it implements the actor model. That's good. And that means lightweight threads and message passing. Um, all the I.O. by default is non-blocking, so whenever you interact with a file system, with a network, it is asynchronous. If you want synchronous interactions, you can just implement that on top of the, the, the the non-blocking I.O., because you're in a lightweight process, it doesn't matter if you block, right? You can try and read a file and just sit and wait for the data to come back. The scheduler will, in the meantime, give someone else CPU time to do whatever they want to do. Um, so the OTP principle, Erlang comes with an extended standard library called OTP, which implements a lot of principles for application design, including those supervision trees that I mentioned, which uh, provide the self-healing capabilities. And it has uh, support for multi-node clusters with location transparency. What that means is that processes can talk to each other no matter where they are, and you don't even notice the difference, other than, of course, the failure, mod, uh, failure mode. Like things, things can fail in different ways if process that you're talking to lives on another server, then there might be a split brain situation. You may still have to implement some sort of leader election um, if you want to have a single process responsible across a cluster of, of servers. But as a, as a starting point, this gives you a lot of, of, of power. Now, it's not all um, peaches and cream. I don't know, what is the expression? Um, while, while it ticks a lot of the boxes, the, the process isolation and also the node isolation was not, they were not originally designed with security in mind. So if I write some code that runs within a process, there are standard library functions that lets me do bad things to other processes. Um, so the, the isolation, and, and, and similarly between nodes, if, I, if I'm on one node, on one server, if I can take control of that instance of the application, I can basically do arbitrary things on other nodes in the cluster. So ideally, if you are saying, okay, these are security features, the isolation is a security feature, you're going to need additional um, capabilities. For example, you might want to have 
some sort of access controls on your process and saying this is, this is a privileged process, it can do whatever it wants, but this is an a, a HTTP request handler, it shouldn't have the, the ability to, for example, spawn an operating system process or talk to the database. There are other processes that have that capabilities and my HTTP request handler can only interact with those processes, but it can never do those things directly. So that, those would be nice things to have. Code signing would be nice to have. There is no code signing currently. When you're talking about integrity, it's not just about the integrity of the data that the process holds. At the end of the day, it matters that the code is also, um, you, you ensure the integrity of the code that's operating on that state, because if arbitrary code could get loaded, then all bets are off, right, for integrity and confidentiality. And static typing, so that's another thing that a lot of people are talking about, how static types can prevent runtime bugs, and runtime bugs can lead to uh, security vulnerability, so static types would definitely help. It's a bit hard to do, st to do static typing when you're doing message passing uh, between actors, because now you need like typed messages, and then you get to something like uh, channels in Go, which are typed, but that limits you in how you interact between, between actors. So this is a, like an ongoing uh, research topic in Erlang. Okay, so this is Erlang. I, I use Erlang every day, I love it, uh, but doesn't mean I don't look at other options that are out there. If I can find something better, I'd be happy to go and start using those other things. So I've looked at some other things. Um, so I mentioned Go, so Go has Go routines and channels. But this only ticks like a few of the boxes, right? It's, it has lightweight concurrency. It has like some fundamental idea of, of, of the actor model where processes can talk to each other through a channel. But it doesn't have the resilience features of like uh, monitoring other processes and responding to, to failures that might happen in, in them. And it still has all the shared mutu mutable states unless you as an application developer choose to uh, ensure this isolation yourself. Now, Java Scala is a bit more interesting because they've got Akka. So Akka is essentially an implementation of some of the ideas of OTP, which comes with Erlang, um, on top of the JVM. Now, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting, it's a, it's a, it, but it turns out to be Quite difficult, first of all, because JVM doesn't really have green threads, right? Am I wrong? I'm not sure I'm wrong. I think I, I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have a scheduler for lightweight processes. Um, and at, at the end of the day, if you're on the Java virtual machine, you probably are in that ecosystem because you want to leverage other libraries, other applications that are available in that ecosystem but those do not necessarily play by Akka's rules. And therefore, your, the benefits that you're getting are only go as deep as your application building on top of Akka, but it doesn't provide guarantees beyond that, right? This is the impedance mismatch I mentioned earlier. Um, so there are other languages. OCaml um, also has lightweight threads, con concurrency features, um, but it suffers from similar issues as, as, as Go, that it, it doesn't have, it doesn't implement, for example, process monitoring. The same thing with uh, Rust, uh, what's it called, Tokyo? Um, very powerful, very good for lightweight concurrency, but again, that's where it stops. It doesn't go all the way. Okay, so. Just to wrap things up, um, where are we, where do we want to be, and how do we get there, right? So there, I told you there's work being done for static types on Erlang and Elixir, so maybe that will keep me on the Erlang virtual machine because you know, more and more of the problems or more and more of the downsides are addressed and I may not need anywhere else to go, right? But maybe other languages will catch up and give me an alternative that offers these benefits. So we see green threads are, are getting pretty common in other languages and other runtimes. Um, I've seen the actor model 
advertised in, in other languages. You know, to, to what extent they fully implement it, I, I'm not sure. And that then the, 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 the missing feature usually is the supervision idea, which is necessary for availability. Now, availability is maybe not the most critical security feature for most people, right? I mean, we all know that a denial of service attack can probably bring down our applications, but it, at the end, it, it is still uh, a, a, one of our responsibilities to keep the application up and running as much as possible. And the supervision, the supervision idea can really, really help there. Um, now, I, I'm really hoping to, to find that someone will come to me after this talk and say, hey, look, I'm using this language, I'm using this, these features, and it gives me many of these same capabilities. Because I love to learn like, what else is out there. Until now, I have not, like every time I try something else, I find myself missing the features that I'm described of Erlang. Um, but awareness is growing, I think. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here, to tell you about this. Maybe it will you know, tickle something in your brain. Maybe you will go and, and uh, talk to the language designers of your favorite language and get them to adopt some of these features. Maybe you'll come to me and tell me that it already exists. Um, and hopefully we can all benefit because I do think that after automatic memory management and eliminating all the buffer overflows and similar bugs, I think concurrency is another area in which there's a lot to be gained from taking some of the responsibility out of the application developer's hand, everyone implementing their own thing and making sure that these things are done properly. Um, by, a, by a runtime. Okay, now before I go, I just want to thank my employer for uh, making it possible to contribute to com the community in general and in particular being here and talking to you today. Um, and that was my talk. Thank you. Thank you.